No, fellas. Yesterday, I went to an actual sit-in restaurant. How was that? Had a drive down to West Virginia. That was strange. We waited, I would say, two hours. Oh. Because they could only yeah. let in, like, five people at a time or something. And, uh, of course, there was a gentleman there that was open mouth coughing. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, how's it over there in Los Angeles? I know that's got to be kind of wacky. Yeah. Um, well, there was a curfew yesterday. There's a curfew tonight. Like, as if there weren't already things going on. But, mm-hmm. I don't know, like, me personally, I work from home. So, like, my life has carried on as normal. <laughs> like, I have the isolation thing down, you know? Right. But, yeah, no, no in-store restaurants yet. It's all takeaway and delivery for me. Yeah, it's kind of been the same, like, uh, around here. There mm-hmm. has been – well, obviously, I mean, you guys just had a bunch of riots. We had riots in Pittsburgh over the mm-hmm. weekend, too. And uh, oh, it's just not good times out no. there. I mean, right. fortunately, we're about 30 minutes south of Pittsburgh, so we haven't yeah. got hit with any, like, civil unrest or anything like that. But, again, just going shopping or anything, it's still really strange. And I would imagine in a more densely populated area like L.A., it's got to be weird. I mean, you guys are kind of shut down for, what, another three months? Yeah, so I think now this is, like, it's been 11 or 12 weeks so far, and this is going on pretty much, like, the whole summer. So, yeah, like, it is strange. Like, that that's the word. And I think as well, the there was kind of enough anger floating around anyway. Yeah. So this was kind of, like, the last thing that this country needed, but here we are, man. Um, it almost seems kind of like an outlet for people. I think that's why it was as extreme as it was, is because everybody's been cooped up. They've been, uh, especially once the weather starts getting nicer too, and we're still having you have to stay indoors or you can't go out in large groups. I think people just had enough, and this was the catalyst that really just uh, things just bubbled over. Totally. Um, well, I think you know, like if you look at, like I would be interested to see in about ten to twelve days what the infection rate is going to be because I mean I'm not a doctor, man, but like if you're in a group of hundreds of people in the street, not everyone's wearing a mask. The thing is going to go. I would imagine yeah. there's going to be an, uh, a, a very large spike, especially in places like New York, too, because that was kind of the epicenter to begin with. Mm. So I don't see that. I don't see it going well. I see that. Yeah. Like you said, the next couple of weeks are going to be bad. And then uh, we might have more of a shutdown. I mean, you, they would kind of have to. They just re- restart it all over again. Yeah. Like here, we're actually just starting to reopen everything. We hit the green phase. So business is supposed to go back to normal. But now I don't see the, how that's right. going to happen. Well, also, I think, like, if you, like, again, like, I'm not a virologist or a doctor, but if you look at the infection rate, it's as high as it's been throughout the whole thing. But now, all of a sudden, okay, everybody back to work. So, I don't know, man, it seems. What they did in New Zealand, because I actually was in New Zealand at the uh, at the end of February when they got their first case, the prime minister said, we're going to treat the entire country as if everybody is infected. Right. So we're just going to assume everybody's infected and, and work from there. And then within like two or three months, they have zero cases. So like they're a different type of country yeah. anyway. Yeah. But it makes sense. Yeah. Or you could be like Sweden, do the exact opposite approach. They just uh, didn't shut anything down. <laughs> they just went out there and they're drinking and just pretend. Well, not pretending it's not happening. They're just letting it happen. I'm interested. Right. To, I guess there will be the control study to yeah. see which right, is the right. better solution here. But. But it's so weird because even with both those places, the population count yeah. compared to something like here or just even other like smaller countries in like New England, like over in Europe and stuff like that, where there's more people. Right. It's hard to it's like. the density, the population yeah. density. That's the problem. So it's kind of weird. Either way, if one does well and one does, doesn't do well, it's not like an even accurate, even, like, you know, yeah. statement you can make about it. Right. And, and yeah, like you can't compare apples with oranges, right? Like in Sweden, if you get sick from anything, you can go to the doctor for free. And yeah. He's going to treat you for free. Like, plus there will be a hospital where you are. So like, if you're in a country with 325 million people and doctors aren't always free, then you're not comparing apples with oranges. You know what I mean? So yeah, you're right, man. It's, it's a weird thing. The, the thing I read the other day was that I think it was in France, they were saying that you can't compare all countries equally, but if you were to average out the known infection rate to what the actual infection rate probably is, they think it's a factor of 10. So let's say if there are a million cases in the US, then there's probably actually 10 million. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's crazy, man. It's just part of the wallpaper now, I guess. Yeah, I mean, 
the near future is not look. It's looking a little grim. Yeah. We talked many times on here about you know your movie going experience. That's not going to be fun. Concerts, anything like that. Even like if we went to the restaurant. Honestly, it's not that good of a time when there's nobody else there. It's weird. And I bet when you're in there, you feel like oh, I gotta hurry up and eat because there's like five hundred people waiting people, outside. Yeah. yeah. And then as far as travel plans, that's just fucked. Yeah. I mean, I, I always travel every year, and I now, like our schedule, mm-hmm. doing uh, different conventions and things, that's blown out of the water. Uh, well, we'll see how things go. Like we've been doing, just play week by week, I guess. Yeah. Uh, with mm-hmm. the riots and stuff, it's... I wish, I wish just once, because we do this weekly, and every week we come on, it's worse than worse yeah, news. Yeah, like you would think at some point in time, you there'd be a wall that you hit, yeah. but there's not. I just want to go on here one week and just be like, hey, everything was great. We had some good news. It's better. We nope. got, hey, we got uh, Elon Musk got us to the space station, American-made, you know, finally American launch. We're not uh, leaning on Russian equipment anymore. I guess that's yeah. good. Mm. That's kind of swept under the rug, though. The I think that was today or yesterday that happened, but... Oh, well. Hey there, folks. You are listening to the Drunk Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me today, what is your name today? I uh, always give you a wacky name. Yeah. Spencer, the Winnipeg Wombat Wrangler. Church. I, I don't get... know if there's wombats in Winnipeg, but... There until... is now. <laughs> uh, today, we have a special guest. Um, the author of Blue Light Yokohama, Sinza Scarlet, and the most rec- his most recent novel, Unknown Male, Mr. Nicholas Obergon. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing, guys? Pleasure to be here. As we briefly talked off air... Before going just the normal interview experience, we decided just to talk uh, writing, you know, talk shop. That's what we do best here, so... Shoot the shit. Yeah, there we go. I guess, though, we will kind of have to start at the beginning, at least, of your writing journey. Uh, mm-hmm. Get the get our listeners who might not be aware of your work, uh, just a little feel for you. You started off kind of as, what, a travel writer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then uh, so, it was during your trip in Japan is where you got the idea for Blue Light Yokohama. and. Uh, exactly. It's kind of your writing career just kind of took off after that. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I never thought that. So I wrote a novel based on a true life case. It's a cold case that's still unsolved today about a family that's murdered in Tokyo in the year 2000. I found out about that whilst I was in Japan. It kind of blew my mind. And I thought, well, what if I wrote a novelized version of this kind of for fun? You know, I didn't plan on trying to get an agent or whatever, uh, but I finished it. My girlfriend, uh, as she was, read it. She was like, this is really good. You should get an agent. So I kind of gave that a go. And then it happened. So it was it was no like grand plan, but it was a decent enough story. So, yeah, <laughs> now I say I'm a writer when I do this for a living. Yeah. That's awesome when you yeah. could just kind of fall into it like that because writing is one of those career – well, it's one of those things where it's hard to just kind of get into a career. It seems mm-hmm. like uh, some people, they write five novels before they hit it, and other people, they can get it right off the bat. Uh, I think right. genre might have something to, you know, that's, yeah. some genres are better to get into than others. Um, as far as, like, fiction writing, did you go into, like, how much fiction writing did you do before you actually went into your first novel? So I wrote this when I was uh, 29, Blue Light Yokohama, the first draft. Up until that point, I'd finished one terrible novel in my life that was maybe 70,000 words long, and it was bad, and that was <laughs> That, that, that was my bibliography. The first ones usually are bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Like, I'm glad it's that way around, you know, like the bad one was first. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd always wanted to write, but it was never like, I'm going to write genre fiction, I'm going to write a detective. It was just kind of more like a kind of esoteric feeling of, I want to put words on a page for a living. But I didn't have like a business plan for that. And I think that's one thing I wish I knew. Because when you do fall into it, you kind of have to learn on the hop. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one thing I wish I knew was that if you if you do this for a living, you kind of also have to know how other people make their living from it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that was I had one crappy novel at about the age of twenty five. That was it. But then I think you know when you know when you've got something good because it just kind of flows for the first time, and you kind of think, ah, oh, this is what it means when people are inspired. This I guess this is what that is. You so actually so, have yeah. passion for that project versus yeah. just kind of a cool idea that you're working out. Exactly. 
Um, so since you didn't have a plan, you didn't really go into it as I'm going to be a crime fiction writer that just, it's more of just that universe that you created that you're, uh, like the character, uh, Kosuke Iwata, you just kind of are writing about him, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're playing on sticking just with crime fiction. You might say, uh, well, I wouldn't say romance, but you know, go outside of your comfort zone as of now, or is it even a comfort zone? So it's weird because I always loved crime fiction. And it always felt like a kind of comfortable default for me. But when I thought about myself previously as a writer, it was never as like a crime writer. Um, and I think, like you say, it just so happened that the character that I kind of gave birth to happened to be a detective. So that was the world which he inhabited. So therefore, you as the writer then inhabit that world. The other side to that is I worked in a bookstore for a while. And at the end of the day, the most amount of work where you had to tidy up was in romance and in crime fiction. Mm. That's where people buy books. So maybe subconsciously I kind of felt like it was more viable more than anything. But um, I think sort of like that. So Chekhov said that Chekhov said that all novels are detective novels because it's a character coming to a truth. And I think what's great about detectives is that's why they exist. They, they exist to come to the truth. So it makes your life easier in the sense that there are there are set rules that exist within the genre. Right. Now that said, I don't want to always be kind of tied to one genre necessarily because, you know, it, by its nature, it's restricting. But then the flip side is that I do want to carry on doing this for a living. I do want to carry on being able to, you know, buy pot noodle and beer, right? So if tomorrow I turn around and say, I'm going to write some big family drama, which is going to be, you know, which is going to have sci-fi elements. And my agent says no. And I also, I kind of, I get that too. So yeah, it was never really like a grand plan to go into crime fiction, but I had loved it growing up. I knew the landscape, I knew the rules, and I knew a way in which I could respect those rules, but then also do my own thing. Mm. And like you say, that's kind of the point of Iwata is that he is a detective, but he's also vulnerable and he has feelings and he has doubts in a way where I think a lot of detectives are just tough guys and they're just banging blondes and knocking down doors. Yeah. And I'm just tired of that, man. Like, I just, I don't care. That, like, I'll watch a Schwarzenegger film if I want that yeah. from the 80s and I'm good. I don't want to read that anymore. So, yeah, that's kind of the overview. Well, like, we talked off air um, probably a week or so ago. We were kind of mm-hmm. talking about how, because I, I mentioned that when I read Blue Light Yokohama, it was kind of like a blending of literary fiction uh, right. with the poetic style that you have and a lot of the metaphors and things aren't real ham-fisted like say a big sleep or you know Raymond Chandler type style uh, noir fiction and that's that's what really caught my attention because I was starting to get into noir fiction I actually found your book just by looking up uh, top Japanese noir fiction which was right. weird because you're not a Japanese citizen when right. I was looking at right. Japanese right. authors but, <laughs> yeah but you still made the list so uh, right. kudos to you that's your name's definitely out yeah. there um, you're actually at the top of the list. I, I don't remember the website, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it was it was just the style that caught my attention because I've read the, like the Big Sleep was it wasn't boring or by any means. It just was like you say, you know, you got the blondes and uh, right. just your ge- generic action and things like that. But I always wanted a little more in my fiction, and that's what you gave me, and that kind of inspired me to work on in my own fiction branching out because I would like to do some crime noir. But I don't want it to be that generic, what you normally read style. I would like to do more of a literary blending. Uh, as far as uh, like the noir genre, how do you kind of go into the atmosphere of that? Because mm. I find in my writing, what I usually focus on first is kind of the details of the setting. And you did a good job of that with like the neon gritty style of Tokyo. But you didn't go to- into it too hard. Like some noir is it's a little over the top with the setting. But uh, right. you definitely did a good job of introducing that. And then in uh, Sins of Scarlet, you have that, that L.A. feel to it, which is always cool because, like, we're both big fans of The Big Sleep. And it's very uh, noir-esque, I yeah. guess, you know, how you go into it. So I think, um, yeah, like, atmosphere definitely. It, if your character has a compelling mission, then that's great because now the reader understands why they're reading the book, right? But – you also need it to feel like it's a compelling mission in a 3D world. And if it feels like kind of pop-ups, then 
then the, you know the reader will go with it, but they're not really going to feel sort of submersed in the sense that they could feel like this is a place that actually exists, right? And I think that's the thing. Like for me, setting is just another character. That's that's a cliche you hear a lot, but I think it is true. If if the atmosphere around your detective is is kind of takes a back seat, then it, the story will feel flat, and what you're left with is gunshots and explosions and car chases, mm. which frankly I don't really care about. Now the flip side is also true where if you spend five pages just describing, you know, what the bar looks like, then after a while, the reader's just like, you know, you're not Vladimir Nabokov, you know, <laughs> and even then you're just getting on their nerves. So I think you need to strike a balance between sort of the world around the detective. For me, I think where mediocre crime fiction departs from superior crime fiction is, you know, the, the, the shitty crime novel will be just about a mystery in the world of the detective. Whereas the superior crime fiction novel will have a mystery surrounding the detective, but it will also be about the mystery within the detective. Right. And when you start having characters who have secrets, but importantly tell lies, right? Like, why do people commit crimes? That's an interesting question, right? Why do people do what they do? That's an interesting question. You know, why do people lie in the way that they lie? That's an interesting question. If you remove all of that, and if you just have will the good guy get the bad guy, yes or no? And you're just kind of left with this tired binary, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, I think the way in which you kind of, for me at least, you approach noir, you approach crime fiction is by, on the one hand, respecting the rules. You know, there has to be a crime. There has to be a detective. There have to be barriers. But then also, at the same time, kind of updating it to, you know, we're not in 1950 anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there are mobile phones. You know, there are moments where your detective can just Google a thing, you know, it makes it less interesting because now you have to kind of think around that. But, but yeah, so atmosphere is important. And I think that was in my second book set in LA. That was definitely something I wanted to do where I'm, I'm from Europe. I've lived now in LA for about four years and everything I've ever read or watched set in LA is a very kind of narrow view of this city where it's like you have bad guys, you have famous people, you know, there's a bunch of palm trees. And most mm. everyone is white. LA is not that. Like, not at all. Yeah. You know, some people are trying to get famous, but quite a small sort of, you know, limited group. The rest of the people are just trying to get by. There's a living and breathing normal city in the background. And you never see that in Hollywood movies. You know what I mean? So that was, I kind of wanted to scratch the surface of the city because even as an outsider, you feel like you're not really getting the real version or you're getting like the postcard version, which is not to say that like I wrote the definitive version of the city but i can stand by that book and say if you read that novel sins of scarlet you walk around la you'll be like okay yeah this makes sense and so yeah i think you 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 know in a roundabout way how to achieve authentic noir is by kind of like blending the um fantastical elements of it which is a neat crime for mm -hmm. a good reason where most crimes are shitty and not for a good reason they're like a five minute you know spur of the moment thing yeah at the same time, making that neat crime with a good reason and a detective and all of that live in a world that's believable. So there's about 10 minutes to answer a very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you uh, did a really good job, like you brought up earlier, just about – it's not necessarily just about the main mystery that's being solved. You did a good job of your protagonist being kind of a mysterious figure and unraveling that person's life as the story goes on. And – when you do that, you actually make it so you're almost invested or more invested in the character than you are the actual mystery. So when you right. get that final climax, and then the the answers you're looking for afterwards, it's like you're satisfied on all ends. Because a lot of times in noir, like you said, you get kind of the generic main hero and you don't really feel for them too much. You kind of get their life and what they're doing, but... A lot of writers, I think, where they fail is they don't have those undercurrents of, like, a strong background to that character. And, right. uh, like, as far as when you came up with the idea, like you said, you read in the newspaper clipping and stuff, that unsolved uh, murder. Yeah. Well, how did you actually come up with the protagonist and then his – I mean, we're not going to go into the crazy details of his backstory or anything, but how did you kind of come up with the more – not necessarily sympathetic character because, you know, he's – uh. What, conflicted what I, almost. Say, what, what I really enjoy about the main character is that, especially with this kind of story, he's not 
perfect. Yeah. Like kind of like when we we just got done reading the Big Sleep, that guy was. He flawless. doesn't have all the answers. He, but yeah, yeah, like he he was always one step ahead of everybody. You know, he he knew everything before everybody else. Mm. But with this story, like he was behind the eight ball, like most of the thing, he kind of just got thrown in. You know, he had, you know he has an alcohol problem. Just like that kind of stuff is what I really. He's enjoyed. like a real person. Yeah. Right. I think. Yeah, you guys are exactly right. Like, you know, the kind of the, the, the Chandra-esque world is a lot of fun to be in. And I and I respect it a great deal because it's what kind of first drew me in to writing. You know, 12 years old, you pick that stuff up and you're like, this shit is just cool, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but after a while, you know, a guy having all the answers and always having a funny quip, after a while you're like, this is just not how people talk. <laughs> yeah. So my uh, English teacher, when I was about 11 years old, she said to me, um, I don't care what it's about and I don't care what's going to happen in the story. I just have to feel. I just have to feel something. And I think that's really good advice. You know, like however you get there, like essentially all the writing advice you will ever get will either be great or it will be bullshit because it will all depend on what works for you. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I do think is universal is that if the reader doesn't feel anything, then it's just going to wash over them. And that might be great for like a two hour flight to Missoula, right? Maybe you just want that. But if you want to form a relationship with the book, you know, you read it in the in, in bed, in the bath, on the bus, whatever it is, then you have to suffuse that with feeling, with with and you have to provoke the empathy of the reader. How do you provoke empathy? You make him feel bad. And so if you make your hero a fucking alpha male who's also a genius, who's also a great detective then you've basically just made Batman, yeah. you know, um, and that's good for what it's good for, but far more fertile territory, I think, is somebody who is always making mistakes and is always suffering. Um, and in spite of that, they still sort of endeavor to come to the truth. That, that guy makes far more sense to me as the reluctant hero than Marlowe does. Cause why is he so reluctant when he's so good at this? Mm. You know, what's the big problem? You kind of get the feeling like he's just kind of too good for it because he'd rather be in a bar somewhere. Now, this is not to say like my detective is superior because that's on its time and, I, and, I, and, that, and that works for what it works for. But my detective would also rather be in a bar somewhere. But because he knows that if you, he undertakes this, he's going to suffer. It's going to open up old wounds. It's going to make him feel bad. So as to like that character came from to kind of answer your first question, when I got that news clipping, it was about the cold case and it was the detectives now 10 years old from the original murders. On the anniversary, they go to the house uh, every year on the 31st of December to kind of bow to the, to, the, to the house, to the memory of this family, to basically ask for forgiveness for not finding the killer. And in this photograph of these detectives, one of the detectives looked quite young and he seemed to be, I mean, it was grainy, so it was hard to tell. But he seemed to be genuinely upset. He seemed to be sort of in tears. And I kind of thought, why does he take this so personally? Why, does, You know, in Europe, when you see policemen talk about murders, they don't cry. You know, they, they certainly don't ask for forgiveness. They're very they distant, yeah. emotional. Because they're men and they're trying to be tough and that's the world they live in, right? Like, I get it. But, but when I thought... You know, why is this one detective on the end of this row of policemen? Why is he so upset? I wondered, like, or maybe he's had some personal tragedy and this kind of opens it up for him. And that was kind of the moment where Kosuke Iwata was born in that moment. It was like, maybe he's not a tough guy. You know, maybe he's not good with the ladies and and maybe he's not in control. Maybe he's just trying to keep it together. That's not like a super, super original uh, character archetype, like it exists in fiction, but there's always a temptation to make him tough because it's easier. And to constantly make a guy weak, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just being born male. Maybe it's like a whole societal, you know, like load on your back, but there's always this like desire to make him strong. So I thought like, no, he's going to be weak. He's going to be vulnerable and he's going to stumble his way to the truth. So that's kind of an overview of where he came from. Um, does that answer your does that answer the question? Answers it is about as well as we could expect. Yeah. <laughs> um, you kind of, just to go back into the middle of what you were saying, you kind of mirrored Martin Scorsese's, uh, like his comments that he made about like the Marvel Universe and, and 
what makes I know this is cinema, but what makes like fun Marvel movies versus actual cinema? That's kind of right. what you're saying with the fiction, because real fiction, at least to me, really makes you feel something and it sticks with you long after you've read it. Versus right. like a big sleep where it's fun, you might enjoy it on a plane or something, read it in an hour or two, and then you kind of just either forget about. Like even now, I I remember the plot of the big sleep. I only read it a couple months ago, but. I can't really remember the details of it too much. It didn't leave an impression on me. I mean, that's obviously not the goal of all writers. If you want to write fun fiction, that's fine. But right. if you want to write something like you did with the, uh, I guess I'll just call it the Iwata trilogy, is you created a world where you actually care about the characters. And like after I read um, Blue Light Yokohama, I was like, damn, this guy is kind of fucked up. Yeah. But you right. can completely understand why he is the way he is versus like we were talking about the generic, you know, has every answer kind of detective. And it's just really refreshing to read something like that because you don't you don't get that too often in, in modern fiction. And I honestly that's why I stick to kind of classic fiction as I do is because I'm always left a little disappointed with uh, right. modern writers, especially genre fiction. Um, right. So that that's kind of why like your book really spoke to me is because – it does have that literary merit that I think a lot of people kind of overlook nowadays. They don't really, whether they go for it or not, or they just don't expect it in genre fiction. Like when you read a good horror story, it's usually not just the, the horror that catches you. It's something else. And uh, I just think that's like that's really important thing to people should start focusing on versus just kind of fluffy, you know, entertainment writing. Uh, so I think in horror, like that, that's a really good example, right? So – because there's crime fiction, and then beyond that, there's like you know horror fiction, which is I think is even more kind of marginalised by the kind of I don't know the literary you know it's snobs, the literary yeah. snobs, right? But here's the thing: is that so if crime fiction preoccupies itself with mystery, right, and it's a process of finding out why the blood has been spilled, right, in simple terms. You know, then horror is even kind of more reduced to just like blood will be spilled and you will have a good time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here's the thing is that whether the package says crime or whether it says horror, the, the idea that because it's horror or because it's crime, therefore it's one thing, without kind of too much exaggeration, like that's literally Nazi ideology, right? Like if your parents were bakers, then you will be a baker, right? Yeah. Like it doesn't follow. So I think like if... Like, I remember, this is just a random example, right? But like, I remember seeing a film a couple of years ago called The Witch. Uh, I think it's 2017. And um, it's set in, like, the 1600s, and it's the first kind of pilgrims who arrive in America, a family they get cast out from for whatever reason into the village, and the father tries to take the family unit into the countryside and live off the land. But, one of the, but the baby gets taken away seemingly by a witch, and the teenage daughter is suspected by the mother of having done this. So, yeah, it's a movie about a witch, and yeah, it's a horror movie, and yeah, there are scary moments, and there's this kind of dread building. But beyond that, there is a mother accusing her daughter of something she didn't do. So that pain and, and that kind of betrayal is what drives that movie. And so you feel for the girl, and then you go with the horror. So, yeah, it's a horror movie, but it's a good movie, whatever the genre is. Yeah, the so only actual it. horror elements in that movie were kind of the setting and the ambiance they set up. There wasn't right. really too many actual – there was no gore, really. There weren't right. monsters or anything like that. And it was what the driving force was, the characters and, you know, how they interacted with each other and, like, kind right. of acts of betrayal or thinking the blame game, as you you can say. Right, right. There's a lot of blame and guilt and things like that. That's what drove the story. And I think that, like, any fiction, especially horror is a good example, if you can have more of that, you're going to have a better story overall. And I feel like a, lo a lot of people kind of focus on cool imagery, especially uh, newer writers. They focus on cool imagery instead of the actual characters and building that right. story and making it, like, a really solid foundation. Totally. And I think, you know, that that's the thing is that if you, as a writer, preoccupy yourself with what – is happening rather than why it's happening, then I think you're kind of limiting yourself. You know, like, sure, the plot is important. The narrative is important. But if you don't understand why you've made those choices, then you're going to have to kind of make it up as you go along. Whereas 
if you have spent, you know, an hour with a, with a, you know, pencil and a pad of paper and just sketch out, like, why is this guy in pain, right? What, why does this guy suffer? Why is this guy angry? And then you choose what your plot's going to be off the back of that. Then you're, then it's, there's, it's kind of richer. It's more fertile ground. So yeah, the, the why to me is always more interesting than the what, frankly. Kind of going along that line, you were talking about plot a little bit there. How do you go about plotting your stories? Are you kind of an outliner? Because I see, I think crime genre, uh, like the crime genre would be better suited for outliners versus, you know, just kind of a discovery writer who just goes, you know, writes the story as you go. What, what kind of is your, your process with that? Yeah. So that, that's, um, that's something I've definitely like improved in as I've kind of written, you know, like I'm, I'm now writing my fourth novel and now it's something where like, I feel more comfortable with it now. It's, it's definitely one of the things I found hard with my first novel because I write that really instinctively, you know, like I, I knew roughly what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there comes a point where you get like maybe halfway into writing your first draft. And there are things that, you know, instinctively, maybe um, you could improve. Right. And I think that there is a tendency, especially for newer writers to kind of think, I'm just going to go with this because it's good. So yeah, like I do plan things out and that's definitely something I've improved on. But I think it's one of those things where like, it's hard, man. Like, like I'm not a CSI guy, like I'm not a a detective. So there are lots of questions that like, for example, if I read my first novel now, I'll see a scene and I'll think, why did he do this and not that? And where was he on Tuesday? You know, there are lots of kind of missing gaps. Um, Yeah, like it's hard work, man. And I I think it's one of those things where crime demands that stuff to be tight. You know, it demands that stuff to to be like Lego bricks that fit together perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, yeah, you you definitely need to kind of, you know, have the sequence down. The, The tough thing is, is that you take out one character in your second draft and now all of a sudden like a house of cards, the whole thing falls down because now this doesn't make sense and that doesn't make sense. So that's that's the really tricky bit about um, writing for genre. I think the the flip side is though that you can have a lot of fun with misdirection. You can you can hide things in plain sight that um, give the illusion of structure. Like for example, you know, you have a, a, a little boy who gets I don't know some some you know the local farmer gets angry at him and quotes the Bible at him when he's 10, right? 10 years later, when when that little boy is now a serial killer and he's killing farmers and he's he's putting scripture on the wall, right? The reader goes, ah, I remember that. Yeah. Right? So, right, so you can have a lot of fun with it at the same time. So yeah, it's it's I definitely have the plan, but it's not one of my it's not my, one of my strong points. Like you said yourself, like my writing I think is poetic. I like always want to like strike a balance between poetry and sort of brutality like i always want it to be beautiful but also raw because like and this is a cliche but because i think that's what life is like you know what yeah. i mean it's very beautiful but it's fucking raw you know so but i think yeah one of my weaker points is definitely structure and making sure that everything everything is tight but pr- practice makes perfect well we've discussed outlining a few times on this show and like personally we both kind of feel that too much structure regardless of genre can be kind of detrimental to your writing and it can kind of kill your passion for the project and as you go on too if you want to change things it could uh it it almost becomes too much work um but also you can't like you were saying you can't really have no structure because then you're just kind of you know you're going on a trail with no light you don't there's nothing in the distance you might have an ending in mind but like we always bring up Stephen King on here his endings are always kind of iffy because he doesn't tend to outline yeah, it's always it's an interesting topic because we, I've had a lot of people, I've, uh, different writers I've discussed outlining with, and most people seem to agree that having kind of just the general outline, make sure you, uh, like you said with the like that religious element you just brought in, you if you have something you implement like that, and you're as long as you remember and you have it in your outline, you can make sure you do a proper callback because you do that a lot in your books is you have the callbacks to – well, you have to kind of do that with crime fiction too. That, that moves the plot forward. But when you have a callback, you have to make sure you get it right. And if you're just kind of winging it, that, that could be problematic. Right. I think as well, like, the thing with structure is that 
the structure, it, it's probably going to be the, the, the thing that the kind of the reader first, first kind of tastes in your writing, right? This is happening. This is happening. Now we're in Paris. Now we're in, you know, Madrid, whatever, right? It, it's the kind of the, the nuts and bolts. Um, if you take a movie like Seven, right? So let's think of a movie like Seven, which is, you know, most people think it at least it's a memorable movie mm -hmm. because it's got that structure to it, right? Like it's the, it's the deadly sins. That's what this killer is doing. So what you're left with is this very kind of economical story, right? There isn't a lot of wasted time. And a lot of the interactions between the detectives happen whilst they're discussing the problem. So their character comes out of the problem they're faced with. And of course, I think it's set over seven days. Now, the reason I think that movie is that, that movie is memorable is not because of the structure alone, because it could be a shitty B movie with the same plot. Right. It's because the killer has a worldview and it's a convincing one, at least to him. And importantly, the detectives also have their own worldview. And those three things clash. So yeah, the structure is important. But what makes that story good is not the structure. It's the kind of the beating heart within it. So I think like, like you say, you need both. The structure kind of has to be there, especially if you're going to give yourself like a rule, like, I don't know, a serial killer who only murders on Valentine's Day every five years, right? Let's say. If he has a good reason to do that, or at least if he thinks he does, then the reader's going to go with it. Otherwise, what you're left with is a gimmick. And there are so many books that, I pick up or even I just see on Twitter that you think this is a version of something that was successful three years ago. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is you're trying to ape what was successful in the past. And that's cool. You're like, you might get published, you might make some money, but now you're going to be left with copying a version of somebody else. And I, I'd, I'd rather be disliked for what I am than to be successful for what I'm trying to be, you know? So yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, it's, structure is important, but I think it has to be, secondary to the, the way the reader feels when they read your work basically yeah i agree it's uh i forgot what i was gonna say um <laughs> there you go long day <laughs> <laughs> did you have uh i mean you said it i mean you cut like with this first like your I don't want to say your first real novel but definitely obviously your first successful novel like with blue light yokohama did you find it I don't want to say interesting, but like, did you have any trouble trying to sell it with it being more of with your poetic style and stuff since it wasn't your typical just crime noir story? No, I actually, I think I had quite the opposite. Um, so I think the thing to, I mean, this is just a personal observation, but basically publishing, whether it's big or small, nobody fucking knows anything, mm. right? Yeah. Like, nobody knows what's going to be in a year's time, right? In big publishing, I think sometimes you can kind of stack the deck, you know, where like a thing gets enough buzz around it that it be kind of it, it kind of becomes a self fulfilling prophecy where it's successful before it's actually out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think generally, because there is so much out there already, what editors are trying to find is uh, something new and something different, right? But then at the same time, not, not too different to the point where readers are going to be left with some weird experimental. Yeah. Fiction. You don't want to turn them off. Right. That's so kind of how you get like a niche audience, but you might not get a broader audience. Right. right. So in fact, one of the conversations that my agent had with my editor at Penguin was that they wanted to flag up the kind of Japanese-ness of the first novel because it's in a, you know, in a quote unquote exotic place and it's far away and the rest of it. Whereas my agent was like, well, that's great. But like, I don't want to like put it in just one bucket, which is, this is, if you're interested in Japan, then you will like this, right. which is how a lot of readers did come to it. But at the same time, he was making the point that, but it's also just a good novel. If this was set in, you know, New Hampshire and still read mm -hmm. well. So I think like, um, in terms of like how, how my style played, Basically, I think a lot of the big publishers were interested because A, I was very young at that time, you know, about six, seven years ago. Um, and B, I think because it's, it's rare to find someone who's walking a line between poetry and genre. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who have that style 
tend to just openly say, I'm going to write literary fiction and, and that's it. And, you know, more power to them, really. But for me, I think, yeah, what I, what I knew was that I wanted to write like a Trojan horse, where on the outside it would look like a crime novel and it would walk and talk like a crime novel. But I, in, on the inside, I was hiding uh, a story about a guy in pain a story about a guy with trauma. And that was the novel I really wanted to tell. Like I was more interested in my detective than I was interested in the bad guy. And normally in crime fiction, the bad guy is more interesting yeah. than the good guy. Yeah. Hannibal Lecter's and so on and so forth. So so yeah, I think in my particular case, it kind of worked for me, but then I'm sure there are lots of other writers who, you know, will tell you, will tell you the opposite. Also, like a lot of it just comes down to luck. You know what I mean? Like there was one guy I met who um, he had written a mystery uh, about a castle uh, on an island just off of the coast of Wales in, in the UK. And um, and I think he was about to get a deal or something like that. But basically it turned out that another book was coming out set on the same island and it was coming out six months before. So that was the end of his thing. Mm. And the publisher was like, go off and write a new thing. Well, that's two years of his life, right? Yeah. That's just bad luck, man. It sucks. Like, what, what can you do, you know? So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a weird... But I think whether you're more poetic or whether you're kind of like a more hard-boiled, gritty type of writer, I think the thing to remember is that editors are thinking, what is fresh about this? What is unique about this? What is interesting about this? Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's hard to answer. It's hard to write something unique. It's hard to write something fresh. But I think the way in which you do that is by staying true to yourself and not copying something else. Right. That may you do that. Well, the thing that stuck uh, stuck out about me with Blue Light, because you were saying about the kind of the exotic land aspect of Japan. Um, I'm always I've always been kind of a Japanophile. Like I've always been interested in the culture. But with your story, it was probably and I read a lot of Japanese fiction too. Yours was probably the first book I read about that is set in Tokyo and just in overall Japan that actually has a realistic depiction of Japanese people. You didn't make them like everyone in the story that they were realistic, like the way, the way, the way they spoke, they swore. Um, I mean, I don't want to give too many, uh, too many things away about the characters in case, you know, for people who want to read it, but Japan is always depicted in a very certain way. And the citizens are always depicted as kind of not meek, but reserved. And I, I understand the cultural, you know, it's more of a community culture, so they are like that to a degree, but you actually had outspoken people. You had the gangsters. Right. Like you had real people, and uh, right. that was a really refreshing aspect of it because I get very tired of reading the same Japan. Right, um, right. And I, I like, like, just, like, little things where, like, I wouldn't even think about, like, instead of, like, shaking hands, people bow to each yeah. other because, like, they, that's the, what they, they do, do in the culture over there. And just, like, little, uh, just, like, little things like that that I, that I really enjoyed that I didn't even think about until reading the story. I was like, oh, yeah, that's probably what they would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, and also, you did a good job, and I think you might have brought this up already, but about the character motivations. Everyone mm-hmm. has their worldview, and... Those worldviews will clash, and obviously the villain's going to have his worldview, and he thinks he's right. Like it's very important to show that people always are going to think they're right, and right. that's where your uh, your drama comes from. Right. And a lot of people, kind of like a lot of writers, they tend to have this kind of ridiculous motives, maybe for their villains. You know, you always get the generic uh, mustache, doctor mustache twirling, yeah, you know? twirling, or like a Doctor Evil. They just want to take over the world. Yeah, but it's, it's just it's very cool to see characters who have the right motivations, and even if they're wrong, you can at least understand why they think the way they do. Even if they seem batshit crazy, like some yeah. cult members, you can right, right. you get the right feeling of oh, I understand why this guy's doing this. Versus, uh, that's unrealistic. I'm just, you right. know, you don't care. Well, and, and I mean, even even if they're batshit crazy, the, the the key thing is that they believe it. Yeah, right? like mm. they they think it's real, right? Like I wouldn't fly an airplane into a building because I'm angry, right? Yeah. I don't believe in anything strongly enough to do that. But those fucking people did yeah. that. Yeah. So that's a real thing. So I think like if 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 you're not working with a believable motivation, even if the motivation is fantastical, right? But if it's not believable to the reader, then you're left with this kind of Scooby-Doo 
evil, yeah. you know, <laughs> which, you know, can be fun. But I think, um, and that's definitely something where, like in my first novel, I think I was like trying really hard to make a thing. I was trying really hard to like be myself, but also to make it exciting enough that publishers would buy it, right? Like, that's why there were kind of some Hollywood moments, I think, in my first novel that in my second novel I tried to get rid of. And yeah. Definitely in, because, yeah, I was like a 29-year-old who, who was trying to, like, get attention from, from publishers. I think, though, uh, the thing, just to go back to the thing you said about Japan, you know, I've had readers say to me, um, I lived in Japan and this really rang true to me. I've had other readers say, you know, I thought it was unrealistic. People never swear. They would never do this. They would never do that. You know, there's 127 million people in yeah. Japan. Well, none of them swear. <laughs> ignoring the fact that, you know, I spent a lot of time there. I had friends who would say some of the things mm. that have turned up in, in the novel. There are gangsters there, you know, like there are bad people there. Sure, there are certain societal norms that kind of become cliche, but that are also real. But like you say, man, like, you know, people owe money and tell lies and break rules like they do anywhere. Like, it's it's just, it's a bit dumb that we have this idea that like, oh yeah, Japanese people are all reserved. Well, it comes down like, say, to... You know, like, all, all French people are rude. Yeah. You know, like, sure, lots are, you know. It kind of comes down to interpersonal comfort levels too, because you have characters dealing with other characters in the story on a regular basis they work together or right. you know maybe somebody's an informant but you have to talk like you have separate ways of speaking to people so yeah. japanese people might act a certain way to somebody they don't know but we all do yeah like we're not going to go to a restaurant and act like crazy you always act different when you're at work than when you do at home around your friends yeah uh, and it's just it's important to uh kind of break that down in your stories too where you make the characters realistic and believable, but like we we're saying, they do act a certain way around other people. I think a lot of people forget to kind of incorporate that. You also did an, another thing in your book that I have, I don't think I've seen before, which was interesting. The story was written in past tense, like most writers, uh, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there is kind of a, like a lot of modern writers have switched to present tense, which mm -hmm. I'm iffy on. I've always just been a past tense guy. But you wrote the memories and the flashbacks in present tense. I thought that was a really interesting choice because I've never seen that before. Yeah, you know, I thought, you know, really that kind of came out uh, instinctively in the first draft. Basically, the the main character, the detective, he's, he's living with these kind of ghosts. Um, and they're so present for him that it made sense to me that the past would be present for mm -hmm. him, if that makes sense. That's how it came so, across to me. I felt yeah. like every time a scene came in that was like that, with, with the present tense, mm -hmm. it feels like the character is in that moment. Right. He, like right. That's where his focus is. Like He can't move mm -hmm. beyond those memories, and I really, really like that because I've never seen it written that way before. Mm -hmm. and that does, I think as well, it's just one of those things where – I don't know, like, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but flashbacks in general, in general, are kind of, it's tricky ground because by their very nature, they're revealing information mm. and dreams and memories. They're kind of hard to do. You know, like you go to bed tonight, you have a dream. It's like this kind of cloud. It's like a fog. It, you know, sure stuff happens and sure there are moments and there are fragments and there are images, but it's not a clear narrative. Right. And then you wake up in the morning, like, what the fuck was that? Dreams in movies or in novels, often they have a clarity that, that just doesn't line up with, with real life. It right? but, that's not how yeah. it really works. Exactly. But then when you do reading into trauma, um, especially people who've kind of survived traumatic events, um, especially if there's guilt involved, the, you know, people talk about these kind of like waking nightmares, right? Where it's like just a loop. And you kind of realize that, like, it's not just like a, it's not just a dream. It's it's like this thing that they're haunted by, and it's just like constantly going over and over on replay. So I kind of thought, yeah, I, I just wanted it to be. I wanted the past and the ghost to be more present and more real to him, almost than what was happening in in the present. In the present, and I think that's the thing with detectives is that detectives don't save anyone, right? Mm -hmm. They go to the crime scene afterwards and they work out why. And so 
basically what you're dealing with is somebody who avenges ghosts more than a hero. Yeah. And often detectives are portrayed as heroes. That's not really something I'm interested in. You know what I mean? Like I'm not interested in heroes. But somebody who says, why did this happen? I will find out. That's more interesting to me. So yeah, flashbacks. I had a lot of fun writing those because to me that's where the that's where the heart and soul of Iwata is shown. But it's tough when you have a character who doesn't say much, when yeah. he doesn't speak of to then get across what he's thinking. So that was a kind of compromise really in the novel to try and show who he was without him explaining to somebody, this is how I feel, because he just wouldn't do that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Well, you're straddling a very fine line with that too, because it's very easy and almost lazy to throw information and flashbacks as a way just right. to progress the story. Just like an info dump. Yeah, an info dump is a perfect word. Um, people do that a lot with prologues, epilogues, yeah. or um, yeah, don't info dump. That, you, you, you just have the one character that's just the the information guy who, yeah. who lays everything out. Like that's his only job in the story. You find that a right. lot, like in shows and stuff. He's the, <laughs> you know, he he's the info guy. Yeah, it's uh, I, I hate that. Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't like when I see that in a flashback where it's like ver- versus how you did it. It was a separate story almost, even though right. it intertwined with the real story. Right. But if it's just like, oh, this is this is why you act this way, and you just throw in a bunch of you know yeah. an info dump, it's it's boring, it's uncreative and uninspired. But the way you did it, I think, is like the perfect style because the readers actually invested in that too. Like I was always. As I was reading, I was going, ooh, I wonder when we're going to hit the flashback. I want to know. like, more, get, a, get a little bit more information. Yeah, like you did the part. I mean, I'm not going to give it away, but the whole thing with the lighthouse, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you actually had multiple flat diff- uh, stories in his flashbacks, which I thought was really cool, too, because it wasn't just, oh, this is what happened. You built upon it. So here's one thing that happened to him when he was young. And then when he was a little older, here's something else. And then you, you really get a forming of the character it's, and why he is the way he is. It's more realistic because very rarely, like if when something happens, it's a, it's a, like a, a singular thing. Yeah. It's normally a, a slight degree of things that, you know, most that, villains don't become villains because of one event. Yeah. Usually it's multiple things that pile up on them. Or the way anybody becomes anyway, there's just a, a series of, of, of small events that lead to one either good thing or bad thing. Or- exactly. Well, like if you look at, for example, like World War II and you look at the Nazis, like, you know, I'm someone who, so my grandmother was French. You know, her mother was in the resistance. My great grandfather died in that war. You know, she was hiding Jews in her barn. That, that's something that, in my grandmother's village is still very real. So you talk about the Nazis to the old people who are still left. And to them, it's the ultimate evil, right? But when you actually learn about the history of World War II, you realize that, you know, the Nazis weren't planning to kill Jews on day one. That, that wasn't the first plan. Right. You know, it came about after several years. So it's that thing where you think it's, it's although it's sort of uncomfortable, you think these guys probably had somewhere along the line had good intentions. And they just made shitty decision after shitty decision and backed themselves into a corner where now all of a sudden, like you wake up one morning, you're like, oh, like, what if we're wrong? Like, what if we're evil? Right. And that's the problem is that once you're locked in to Mm. your world, what what are you going to do? Right. So I think it's that thing of if, you know, to take it back to your, your thing about flashbacks, I think if your flashbacks are giving away crucial information in the present day, then it can feel a bit cheap. Right. Um, especially if the flashbacks are revealing the bad guy, right? Like, especially yeah. if the flashbacks are saying, well, this is what happened to him to make him what he is today. What I hadn't seen so much was these kind of flashbacks for, for the protagonist. So the, so the flashbacks are never giving away information that's relevant to the, to the case that he's investigating. Because then what you would be doing is you would be giving more information to the reader than protagonist actually has right so then there becomes this imbalance right so so yeah no that, that's the thing that, that i think is interesting about evil is that you know if evil knows what it is and it's happy with that then it's just like a super villain it's the joker mm-hmm. right if evil doesn't realize it's evil now we're in interesting territory right like now now we're asking difficult questions of the reader and that i think is ultimately something that's going to be far richer for the reader to, to kind of absorb another thing you did which is something we always suggest to people when they're submitting 
even if it's just short stories to literary magazines and whatnot, is to have a very powerful opening. And so mm-hmm. far in your first two books I've read, you've had a very powerful opening, either opening with some kind of murder or, uh, you know, the action is right there. And was that a conscious decision or did that just how you wanted to start your story? Did you really think about, oh, this is going to catch the reader's attention or the publisher or, you know, something along those lines? Yeah, I think, but you know, the, the really tricky thing is to write in such a way where you're not constantly thinking about the reader, mm-hmm. right? So book one, um, I kind of vaguely knew that maybe I would submit. And so maybe that did influence me trying to like open with a, with a bang. Um, but at the same time, I didn't have anything lined up. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a book deal. By book two, I had a big book deal and an agent and the rest of it. So now all of a sudden, you know, in book one, you're saying, I enjoy dancing. So you're just dancing in the dark by yourself. Mm-hmm. And now with book two, you know, you're up on a stage and people are expecting you to dance, right? So it's like a different, it's a very different thing. So I think with, you know, a, a kind of uh, a vivid prologue, I find those interesting because it's like throwing a stone into a lake and then it ripples up. Right. What I like about those is, is playing around with when those ripples take six months, a year, five years, you know, when, when those things sort of echo out in time and bringing it back to the present, that's a lot of fun. And it also helps with your structure, right? Like A happened and that's how we arrive at X. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that they, you have to write them in such a way where they feel like real events. You know what I mean? Maybe not real, but they have to kind of feel authentic somehow because if it's just, I don't know, like some terrorists hijack a boat or whatever it might be, like, and bombs go off, the exciting thing there is not the bombs going off, right? It's it's the, oh, my God, what will happen? Will yeah. the hostages be killed? It's the questions. So I think if you're opening, yeah, it's exciting and, yeah, it's vivid and the rest of it, but if it's asking questions, you know, why did this woman jump out of a cable car? How will that relate? To the, to the mystery in the present day. Those questions are are really what's going to echo out in the story rather than just like a bunch of people were killed. You know, think of the ramifications. So I think it's it's the, the when you have these sort of prologues, the, the risk that you run is trying to set off too many fireworks versus sort of piquing someone's interest. And I think it's that thing where people are so desensitized to fireworks by now that, you know, you're just getting into the realm of ridiculousness mm. if you try and outdo what the last guy did. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, I think you need to walk the line between, you know, punching the reader in the face and being like, listen, this thing is going to fucking happen. Deal with it. But at the same time, then making them think, well, why did that happen? Why did I get punched in the face? You, you know what I mean? Like, so that was kind of my take. I think kind of taking the approach that that beginning is your seed oh, where the rest of the story grows from. Um right, exactly. Again, you don't have to punch the reader in the face, but you can still you. I, I would say you still want an effective beginning because a lot of classic literature reason a lot of people don't enjoy it is because they can't get into it because it doesn't start for ten chapters or something. Kind of going back to what you were talking about with the book deal. Do, do you feel that gives you any kind of pressure to get your work done faster? It's just something um, we've randomly talked about on here in the past. Yeah, I mean, like basically, what you're yeah when you sign a book deal, especially if it's for more than one book. Like, you know, and again, this is a very sort of first world problem, you know, because if you just said to me, you know, five years ago, you're going to have, you know, a multi-book deal, there's going to be pressure. I would have been like, fucking bring it on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, so your name is now on a contract. You've now signed an agreement, right? Um, Now, in reality, if I say to my editor, listen, I need another two months, she probably would have said, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. But technically... I've broken the contract. My deadline is whatever, and I have to deliver on that day. So you could get in trouble, right? You could lose money, blah, blah, blah. So it just by having a deadline written down in black and white, it does make it real and it does make it more scary. The flip side to that is that I think it also gives you a great deal of confidence. You know, that, that to me was kind of like the first time I ever felt comfortable with my own writing is when you kind of realize that like, shit, like on the, on the one hand, people are going to read my books, mm-hmm. right? That's scary. It's sort of like taking off all your clothes and walking into a room. Yeah, it's going to be like, a weird people. transition yeah. going from unread to read by a lot of people. Right. But then the flip side to that is, 
um, if you know a publishing house, whether they're big or small, they're giving you money and they're 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 going to push you. Um, then the flip side is that you realise that like oh well, there must be something here, right? Like th- there must be something that they've seen in, in this. So I think like getting a book deal um, is a kind of double edged sword in that you can't really hide anymore. You can't really say I'm working on a manuscript. One day I'm going to submit. Now you kind of have to do the thing. Right? Yeah. Um, the flip side is that if you actually do want to write. You know, because I like I've got friends who say they're writers. They've been writing a novel for eight years. Yeah. You know, what they really want to do is have a nice bookshelf and impress girls when they come round. Right? <laughs> like, I get it, you know. But but writing is, as they say in the UK, it's bums on seats. Mm. You know, you've got to sit down and do the fucking thing every single day. And I think the thing about the book deal is that now you think, okay, they want me to do this, and it feels like a job now. And I think that's the weird line you walk is that before I had a book deal, I never would have gone to a party and said to people, um, I'm a writer. Now that's no shade on people who do, because I don't think being published is the be all and end all. But to me, it just didn't feel like it was a real thing until yeah. I was getting paid to do it. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, man, look, the, the, the business side to publishing is a weird world. Um, and it's a, it's a bizarre thing. Like I've had, meetings with movie people here in LA and it's like the same thing as publishing, but just like on acid, you know, yeah. where basically you're dealing with people who should love stories and creativity, but what they do for a living is money. Yeah. So it's this weird disconnect, man, that often the best money people are not the story guys and the best story guys are not money people. Mm. You know what I mean? So yes, yeah, it's, it's a weird job, man. Someone has to do it though, right? So do you do you feel like your your previous job as what well, as like a travel writer? Do, do you think that helps you at all with like getting stuff done like on a deadline or getting a certain amount of work? That, even if it's like a personal deadline, like I want to have this many chapters done right. in in like a week or whatever, like that. Do, do, do you think that skill set helps at all with what you're yeah, currently doing? Question. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I I think for sure it helped. So I, when I, I was 23 when I started that job. So I left university, I traveled around, and then that was like my first real job that wasn't like in a bar, you know, or a mm. bookshop. And that meant that I was exposed, one, to an editor, and you understand how the process works from you putting the thing on the page to, you know, she's actually putting it out on, on paper and sending it off to readers. That definitely helped. Having deadlines definitely helps. I think as well, like just, you know, from a, from a practical point of view, Get, getting paid to write stuff. And even if it's a shitty little article, like my first ever article for this travel magazine, right? I got this job back when I was 23 and I was like, wow, I'm going to get paid to travel and to write. Like, <laughs> Sounds like a like dream being, job. Oh, yeah. Gonna, yeah, like it's like being told like, oh, like you're going to be the new James Bond, right? <laughs> um, like I, they sent me to Italy once and I was going through the airport and uh, yeah, I think it was like 24 or something. And the guy at the airport said to me, uh, is this business or is this pleasure? And I said, oh, it's business. I remember feeling ridiculous as I was saying that. <laughs> like, was like he looked at me like, mm, you mean drugs or like, what was it? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I, I thought like this was the perfect job. So in my mind, I was imagining like, is it going to be like the Caribbean? Is it going to be like Monte Carlo? Like, are they going to send me to Madagascar? They sent me to a cheese festival in India. <laughs> And I was like, oh, man. But I still wrote a tiny little article about that cheese festival and it was like 200 words and they were my 200 words, right? So those are the first ever words that were published in the public domain about a shitty cheese festival, right? <laughs> like, I don't even like cheese. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know that, but, you know, I did the thing. But those 200 words that had my name on them, they felt good and they, they felt scary. But, you know, you get a taste of it and you want more. So it definitely helps to have exposure to a publishing process because a publishing process has got nothing to do really with the writing process. They're two different things. That was one of the things that I think I learned at that travel magazine was that like, you know, when you're a kid and you say, I want to be, I want to be a writer or I want to be an astronaut or I want to play football, the love of football and the love of space and writing is actually got very little to do with what it is to work as an astronaut or as a football player or whatever else. Mm. You know, they're, they're sort of they're, they're two, they're sort of non-overlapping worlds in many ways. 
So it definitely helps, but um, the biggest lesson is you only get a certain amount of space. You only get a certain amount of space, and after that, you're just giving problems to the people you work with. So if I get a deadline and if I get a certain word count, I'm going to stick to that. Those are good habits. You know, economy of writing helps you choose. You know, I've only got, let's say I've got 50 words and I want 10 words to be poetic. Mm. Now you've only got 10 words to write some beautiful stuff. It helps you choose. So yeah, it de- I, de- I definitely do think it helps. Um, but I think it's, it's more the, the practical side of it uh, that you're not easily exposed to. That's why like if you're at university or something like, Join the newspaper, right? Join the writing club, join something. Give yourself deadlines, um, give yourself challenges. Because if it's only ever comfortable to write, then you're not, you're never going to write at your peak. You need to be challenging yourself mm-hmm. in order to get stronger. It's like anything, I guess. Well, since writing is your actual job now, and then you can yeah. tell people you're a writer, uh, have you implemented a strict writing routine that you maintain? Yeah, so I do... Um, I, I, I tend to stick to uh, Monday to Friday, kind of like nine to about six in the evening, basically office hours. When I got my book deals, you know, I was at, and I, so I was working, I was still in publishing. I was in, I'd moved from travel writing into legal publishing, which was as interesting as that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it meant that I still got to work with words and letters uh, all day. And so by that point, I was a deputy editor. So I was still going to work Monday to Friday, you know, nine to six. And so when I got these book deals, I basically decided early on that, you know, I had to stick to that, to that same working week just at home because otherwise, man, I was like, you know, going to fire up the PlayStation or go on YouTube, (laughs) go to the pub with my friends and the the thing won't get written or it will get written, but it just take a lot longer. Um, So that's, I kind of try and stick to that. Now that said, you know, it will be Sunday afternoon and I'll still be writing. But it's just that in my mind, that's the weekend. You know, you see people, you do nice stuff. It, it, I don't feel bad if I don't write on the weekends in a way where like, if it's Monday morning at 11, I need my coffee. I need to be looking at the mm-hmm. page. But otherwise I'm not doing my job. You know what I mean? Yeah. Our problem is trying to balance that real life job versus be trying to become a writer. So you have to write in your free time versus actually writing is your yeah. job. Uh, I yeah. think a lot of authors getting over that hump is the real struggle. Um, sure. And you, you know, you had a legal writing job. I feel like I would be less inclined to write after in my free time that, after yeah. doing oh, that all right. day. Know. Like it's, it's you know, like you hear about porn stars, you know, like they <laughs> fuck people all day long and then you go home and you have a wife as well. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's definitely hard to um, deal with writing all day long and then go home and deal with your own writing. You know, there's there's no secret formula to it, man. Like when I wrote my first novel, I was in a full-time office job and I was doing my master's part-time in creative writing. So I was tired, man. Like I, mm. I was, you know, it was, I mean, look, I was like 28, 29. So like that's the age, you know, like now at 36, you know, uh. <laughs> man. Um, but there's no secret formula to it but look it's like anything man it's like if you wake up at 5am to go for a run and you're overweight it's going to fucking suck it's going to feel bad if you do that for six weeks after six weeks it's not going to feel great but it's it's your routine and this, now this is what you do it gets easier so over think, time yeah so I think it's that thing of like it's it's never easy but you have to force it into a routine even if that's like you know, I'm going to take a dictaphone with me into the car so that when I drive to work, I'm spitballing ideas on my dictaphone. Tonight, I'm going to write them down. And just, you know, little things like that. Like there's always half an hour in your day somewhere. Mm. Well, I don't care if you have kids or what. Like there's, you can always like fashion a tiny little fragment of time. If you can't, then it's going to be really difficult to write that fucking book, you know, but <laughs> it's never going to be easy. But then I think the flip side is that when you have a really good idea you want to come to the page you know you're excited to come to the page it feels like it feels like the way out you know what i mean it feels mm-hmm. like a distraction i remember specifically that came to me uh, at the end of chapter three of my first draft it had been hard work then i got to the end of chapter three and i read it back and i remember feeling excited where was this going to go and by chapter four 
you know, it was like, you know, falling in love for the first time. Like you just can't think about anything else. Yeah. You just constantly want to go back to, to, to the page. So if you come up with a good story idea, it's a lot easier, even when you're tired, I think. Yeah, the actual story you're writing, it is work, but if you love it enough, it's not going to feel like work necessarily. You're in, you actually look forward to sitting down and working on yeah. it. Uh, totally, yeah. I guess if you don't, if you sit down with the story you're working on, it's kind of a, you know, you're just like, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Then maybe that's not the, maybe you should abandon it or right. just put put it to the side. That might not be the story to right. pursue. Yeah, if you if you don't love what you're writing. How do, how do you like, expect your readers to like yeah. it if you can, right. if you can't get through it? Exactly, and I think as well, like the, it, at the same time, like you, on your first draft, you have to give yourself a break in that, like it's not going to be fantastic on your first draft, but you should be like at least into the idea because mm-hmm. if you're just like I'm just doing this thing and you're not even having fun with it, you know, or you're not even at least finding it interesting, then you know, I, th- I think there needs to be a little bit of you in that story. Otherwise, you're just kind of going through the motions. You know what I mean? And I right. think that will show in the final product. Hey. <laughs> Special guest. He's been pretty good so yeah. far. <laughs> um. Well, we're already over an hour, so I think we ran the well pretty dry here. Yeah. Unknown Mail, that's your latest book, right? That's only right. in the UK, I think you were telling me. Yeah, so my US book deal was only a two book deal, mm-hmm. uh, whereas in the UK it was four books. Um, and so Unknown Mail is the third and the final installment of the Kosuke Iwata trilogy. Um, and yeah, so it, that came out in November in the UK in hardback. Like I, I'm sure you can still find it online. Like it's, it's in English, right? Um, but the paperback was meant to come out this summer just in time for the Olympics, right now. Right. Oh, does that suck? Wow. Yeah, that it's set in the Tokyo yeah, Olympics. Yeah. Oh, what so, a show. Like, now the, the, the virus is like completely fucked over my, my timeline. Once in a lifetime yeah, pandemic. It's, it's right. like in, in this pandemic, to be fair. But uh, so I'm known now as the third one. Right now I'm work, working on a standalone fourth novel, which is unrelated to Iwata. And loosely, uh, it's about uh, an ex-Amish girl who uh, has become a private eye in LA. She's kind of very sketchy, kind of like working hard jobs. And then um, she has to go back to her old community mm. to solve a murder, basically. Oh. So it's completely unrelated. So yeah, and that's going to be out uh, next year. Amish crime fiction. That, uh, yeah, man. Man. <laughs> Keep an that's eye out for it, yeah. folks. The, the next yeah. new thing. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've never even heard yeah. of it before, so let alone reading it, I think that's going to be pretty damn good. Yeah, it sounds entertaining that. already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, where can people find you? So uh, you'll find me on Twitter, although I'm more of a lurker than a contributor. But yeah, so it's um, at Nick Obregon. Um, my website is obregonbooks.com. That's O-B-R-E-G-O-N books.com. Instagram, Facebook, like I'm, I'm in all the, I'm in all the places. Um, and yeah, like just type it into the Google machine. You'll find me blue light Yokohama. It's the first thing that comes up. Nice. Um, cause actually you, you guys know that blue light Yokohama was an old love song, right? Yeah. And so like the, the guy who wrote that song, who's like a hundred years old, <laughs> I had to buy the rights off of that guy in order to like use his lyrics. And he like charged me a lot of fucking money. Really? <laughs> yeah, some old Japanese composer. Yeah, he was like number one on Christmas Day in like 1969. <laughs> they take that stuff song. seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, you can have the lyrics, but it's going to cost you. So he probably needs it. No, I'll never, I'll never pay for lyrics ever again, man. That's a one time. That's a one time thing. Note to so, writers yeah, out there who want to throw the Beatles or something yeah. into your story, you might have to pay for that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good lesson. It's a good <laughs> lesson. Actually, funnily enough, in the US, uh, the copyright law here that you guys have is a lot more flexible than it is in the UK. Mm. Like here, there's fair use. Fair use, you can maybe get away with quoting some poetry or some lyrics. You know, not a lot, but you can get away with a bit. In the UK, if you quote four words from a guy's poem, you have to pay him. True. So uh, always pick people who have been dead for, I think it's 70 years. That Not actually explains years. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a lot oh, of that in stories, and it's usually dead guys. 
Yeah, man. That's where it's at. So like Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde, all that good stuff. Mm. Never even thought of that. Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to check out the work we do, you can go to www.drunkenpenwriting.com. You could follow us on Twitter as well, at Drunk Pen Writing, on Instagram at Drunk Pen Writing, where we barely post, and uh, <laughs> Facebook if you'd like to yell at us and tell us what shitty interviewers we are, you can go Drunk Pen Writing on Facebook. Um, I thank you, good sir, for joining yeah. us. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's been a pleasure, man. Really cool talking to you. Yeah, you're welcome anytime, yeah. and when you want to promote your next book, too, feel free to come yeah. on. We Great. Nothing else going on over here, except for, for right. riots and yeah. <laughs> plagues and... The murder hornets, though, have... Have built, yeah. Yeah. The mur- talking about the murder hornets. That was just like a filler episode. We had the murder hornets, but now we're not so worried about them at the moment. Till they... We find out they also distribute coronavirus. <laughs> All right. Well, so, by the next book, there, there's, you know, the pandemic is over. And, you know, maybe by that point, it'll be like cyborgs or Skynet or something. But if one, we're around, we'll do it. One can only hope. All right, folks. Well, see you later. Thanks for listening.